Out of the Silent Planet by C.S. Lewis To my brother W. H. L., a lifelong critic of the space and time story. Note. Certain slighting references to earlier stories of this type, which will be found in the following pages, have been put there purely for dramatic purposes. The author would be sorry if any reader supposed he was too stupid to have enjoyed Mr. H. G. Wells' fantasies or too ungrateful to acknowledge his debt to them. C.S.L. Chapter 1 The last drops of the thunder shower had hardly ceased falling when the pedestrian stuffed his map into his pocket, settled his pack more comfortably on his tired shoulders, and stepped out from the shelter of a large chestnut tree into the middle of the road. A violent yellow sunset was pouring through a rift in the clouds to westward, but straight ahead, over the hills, the sky was the colour of dark slate. Every tree and blade of grass was dripping, and the road shone like a river. The pedestrian wasted no time on the landscape, but set out at once with the determined stride of a good walker who has lately realised that he will have to walk farther than he intended. That, indeed, was the situation. If he had chosen to look back, which he did not, he could have seen the spire of much Nadaby, and, seeing it, might have uttered a malediction on the inhospitable little hotel which, though obviously empty, had refused him a bed. The place had changed hands since he last went for a walking tour in these parts. The kindly old landlord on whom he had reckoned had been replaced by someone whom the barmaid referred to as the lady. And the lady was apparently a British innkeeper of that orthodox school who regards guests as a nuisance. His only chance now was Stirk, on the far side of the hills and a good six miles away. The map marked an inn at Stirk. The pedestrian was too experienced to build any sanguine hopes on this, but there seemed nothing else within range. He walked fairly fast and doggedly, without looking much about him, like a man trying to shorten the way with some interesting train of thought. He was tall, but a little round-shouldered, about thirty-five to forty years of age, and dressed with that particular kind of shabbiness which marks a member of the intelligentsia on a holiday. He might easily have been mistaken for a doctor or a schoolmaster at first sight, though he had not the man of the world air of the one or the indefinable breeziness of the other. In fact, he was a philologist, a fellow of a Cambridge college. His name was Ransom. He had hoped when he left Nadaby that he might find a night's lodging at some friendly farm before he had walked as far as Stirk. But the land this side of the hills seemed almost uninhabited. It was a desolate, featureless sort of country, mainly devoted to cabbage and turnip, with poor hedges and few trees. It attracted no visitors like the richer country south of Nadaby, and it was protected by the hills from the industrial areas beyond Stirk. As the evening drew in and the noise of the birds came to an end, it grew more silent than an English landscape usually is. The noise of his own feet on the metalled road became irritating. He had walked thus for a matter of two miles when he became aware of a light ahead. He was close under the hills by now and it was nearly dark, so that he still cherished hopes of a substantial farmhouse until he was quite close to the real origin of the light, which proved to be a very small cottage of ugly 19th century brick. A woman darted out of the open doorway as he approached it and almost collided with him. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' she said. "'I thought it was my Harry.' Ransom asked her if there was any place nearer than Stirk where he might possibly get a bed. "'No, sir,' said the woman. "'Not nearer than Stirk. I, I dare say they might fix you up at Natterby.' She spoke in a humbly fretful voice as if her mind were intent on something else. Ransom explained that he had already tried Nadaby. "'Then I don't know, sir. I'm sure, sir,' she replied. "'There isn't hardly any house before Stirk. Not what you want. There's only the rise where my Harry works, and I thought you was coming from that way, sir. And that's why I came out when I heard you, thinking it might be him. 
He ought to be home this long time. The rise, said Ransom. What's that, a farm? Would they put me up? Oh, no, sir. You, you don't see. There's no one there now except the professor and the gentleman from London, not since Miss Alice died. They wouldn't do anything like that, sir. They don't even keep any servants, except my Harry, for doing the furnace-like. And he's not in the house. What's this professor's name? asked Ransom, with a faint hope. I don't know, sir, I'm sure, said the woman. The other gentleman's Mr. Devine, he is, and Harry says the other gentleman is a professor. He, he don't know much about it, you see, sir, being a little simple, and that's why I don't like him coming home so late. And they said they'd always send him home at six o'clock. It isn't as if he didn't do a good day's work, either. The monotonous voice and the limited range of the woman's vocabulary did not express much emotion. But Ransom was standing sufficiently near to perceive that she was trembling and nearly crying. It occurred to him that he ought to call on the mysterious professor and ask for the boy to be sent home. And it occurred to him just a fraction of a second later that once he were inside the house, among men of his own profession, he might reasonably accept the offer of a night's hospitality. Whatever the process of thought may have been, he found that the mental picture of himself calling at the rise had assumed all the solidity of a thing determined upon. He told the woman what he intended to do. Thank you very much, I'm sure, sir, she said. And if you would be so kind as to see him out of the gate and on the road before you leave, if you see what I mean, sir, he's that frightened of the professor and he wouldn't come away once your back was turned, sir, not if they hadn't sent him home themselves like. Ransom reassured the woman as well as he could, and bade her good-bye, after ascertaining that he would find the rise on his left in about five minutes. Stiffness had grown upon him while he was standing still, and he proceeded slowly and painfully on his way. There was no sign of any lights on the left of the road, nothing but flat fields and a mass of darkness which he took to be a copse. It seemed more than five minutes before he reached it and found that he had been mistaken. It was divided from the road by a good hedge, and in the hedge was a white gate, and the trees which rose above him as he examined the gate were not the first line of a copse, but only a belt, and the sky showed through them. He felt quite sure now that this must be the gate of the rise and that the trees surrounded a house and a garden. He tried the gate and found it locked. He stood for a moment undecided, discouraged by the silence and the growing darkness. His first inclination, tired as he felt, was to continue his journey to Sturk. But he had committed himself to a troublesome duty on behalf of the old woman. He knew that it would be possible, if one really wanted, to force a way through the hedge. He did not want to. A nice fool he would look, blundering in upon some retired eccentric, the sort of man who kept his gates locked in the country. With this silly story of a hysterical mother in tears because her idiot boy had been kept half an hour late at his work. Yet it was perfectly clear that he would have to get in. And since one cannot crawl through a hedge with a pack on, he slipped his pack off and flung it over the gate. The moment he had done so, it seemed to him that he had not till now fully made up his mind. Now that he must break into the garden, if only in order to recover his pack, he became very angry with the woman and with himself. He got down on his hands and knees and began to worm his way into the hedge. The operation proved more difficult than he had expected, and it was several minutes before he stood up in the wet darkness on the inner side of the hedge, smarting from his contact with thorns and nettles. He groped his way to the gate, picked up his pack, and then for the first time turned to take stock of his surroundings. It was lighter on the drive than it had been under the trees, and he had no difficulty in making out a large stone house, divided from him by a width of untidy, neglected lawn. The drive branched into two a little way ahead of him, the right-hand path leading in a gentle sweep to the front door, while the left ran straight ahead doubtless to the back of the premises of the house. He noticed that this path was churned up into deep ruts, now full of water, 
as if it were used to carrying a traffic of heavy lorries. The other, on which he now began to approach the house, was overgrown with moss. The house itself showed no light. Some of the windows were shuttered, some gaped blank, without shutter or curtain, but all were lifeless and inhospitable. The only sign of occupation was a column of smoke that rose from behind the house with a density which suggested the chimney of a factory, or at least of a laundry, rather than that of a kitchen. The rise was clearly the last place in the world where a stranger was likely to be asked to stay the night, and Ransom, who had already wasted some time in exploring it, would certainly have turned away if he had not been bound by his unfortunate promise to the old woman. He mounted the three steps which led into the deep porch, rang the bell and waited. After a time he rang the bell again and sat down on a wooden bench which ran along the side of the porch. He sat so long that though the night was warm and starlit, the sweat began to dry on his face and a faint chilliness crept over his shoulders. He was very tired by now, and it was perhaps this which prevented him from rising and ringing a third time. This and the soothing stillness of the garden, the beauty of the summer sky, and the occasional hooting of an owl somewhere in the neighbourhood, which seemed only to emphasise the underlying tranquillity of his surroundings. Something like drowsiness had already descended upon him when he found himself startled into vigilance. A peculiar noise was going on, a scuffling, irregular noise, vaguely reminiscent of a football scrum. He stood up. The noise was unmistakable by now. People in boots were fighting or wrestling or playing some game. They were shouting, too. He could not make out the words, but he heard the monosyllabic barking ejaculations of men who are angry and out of breath. The last thing Ransom wanted was an adventure but a conviction that he ought to investigate the matter was already growing upon him, when a much louder cry rang out, in which he could distinguish the words. Let me go! Let me go! And then a second later, I'm not going in there! Let me go home! Throwing off his pack, Ransom sprang down the steps of the porch and ran around to the back of the house as quickly as his stiff and footsore condition allowed him. The ruts and pools of the muddy path led him to what seemed to be a yard, but a yard surrounded with an unusual number of outhouses. He had a momentary vision of a tall chimney, a low door filled with red firelight, and a huge round shape that rose black against the stars, which he took for the dome of a small observatory. Then all this was blotted out of his mind by the figures of three men who were struggling together so close to him that he almost cannoned into them. From the very first, Ransom felt, no doubt, that the central figure, whom the two others seemed to be detaining in spite of his struggles, was the old woman's Harry. He would like to have thundered out, What are you doing to that boy? But the words that actually came, in rather an unimpressive voice, were, Here, I say! The three combatants fell suddenly apart the boy blubbering. "'May I ask,' said the thicker and taller of the two men, "'who the devil you may be, and what you are doing here?' His voice had all the qualities which Ransom's so regrettably lacked. "'I'm on a walking tour,' said Ransom. "'And I promised a poor woman—' "'Poor woman be damned,' said the other. "'How did you get in?' "'Through the hedge,' said Ransom who felt a little ill temper coming to his assistance. I don't know what you're doing to that boy, but we ought to have a dog in this place, said the thick man to his companion, ignoring Ransom. You mean we should have a dog in this place if you hadn't insisted on using Tartar for an experiment, said the man who had not yet spoken. He was nearly as tall as the other, but slender, and apparently the younger of the two and his voice sounded vaguely familiar to Ransom. The latter made a fresh beginning. Look here, he said. I don't know what you are doing to that boy, but it's long after hours and it's high time you sent him home. I haven't the least wish to interfere in your private affairs, but... Who are you? bawled the thick man. My name is Ransom. 
if that is what you mean. And, by Jove, said the slender man, not Ransom, who used to be at Weddenshaw. I was at school at Weddenshaw, said Ransom. I thought I knew you as soon as you spoke, said the slender man. I'm divine. Don't you remember me? Of course, I, I think I do, said Ransom as the two men shook hands with the rather laboured cordiality which is traditional in such meetings. In actual fact, Ransom had disliked Divine at school as much as anyone he could remember. Touching, isn't it? said Divine. The far-flung line even in the wilds of Sturk and Natterby. This is where we get a lump in our throats and remember Sunday evening chapel in the D.O.P. You don't know Weston, perhaps? Divine indicated his massive and loud-voiced companion. The Weston, he added. You know, the great physicist has Einstein on toast and drinks a pint of Schrodinger's blood for breakfast. Weston, allow me to introduce my old schoolfellow, Ransom. Dr. Elwyn Ransom, the Ransom, you know. The great philologist has Jesperson on toast and drinks a pint. I know nothing about it, said Weston, who was still holding the unfortunate Harry by the collar. And if you expect me to say that I am pleased to see this person, who has just broken into my garden, you will be disappointed. I don't care tuppence what school he was at, nor on what unscientific foolery he is at present wasting money that ought to go to research. I want to know what he's doing here, and after that, I want to see the last of him. Don't be an ass, Weston, said Divine in a more serious voice. His dropping in is delightfully apropos. You mustn't mind Weston's little way, Ransom. Conceals a generous heart beneath a grim exterior, you know. You'll come in and have a drink and something to eat, of course. That's very kind of you, said Ransom. But about the boy. Divine drew Ransom aside. Barmy, he said in a low voice. Works like a beaver as a rule but gets these fits. We're only trying to get him into the wash house and keep him quiet for an hour or so till he's normal again. Can't let him go home in his present state. All done by kindness. You can take him home yourself presently if you like and come back and sleep here. Ransom was very much perplexed. There was something about the whole scene suspicious enough and disagreeable enough to convince him that he had blundered on something criminal while, on the other hand, he had all the deep, irrational conviction of his age and class that such things could never cross the path of an ordinary person except in fiction, and could least of all be associated with professors and old schoolfellows. Even if they had been mistreating the boy, Ransom did not see much chance of getting him from them by force. While these thoughts were passing through his head, Divine had been speaking to Weston in a low voice, but no lower than was to be expected of a man discussing hospitable arrangements in the presence of a guest. It ended with a grunt of assent from Weston. Ransom, to whose other difficulties a merely social embarrassment was now being added, turned with the idea of making some remark. But Weston was now speaking to the boy. "'You have given enough trouble for one night, Harry,' he said. And in a properly governed country, I'd know how to deal with you. Hold your tongue and stop snivelling. You needn't go into the wash house if you don't want. It weren't the wash house, sobbed the half-wit. You know it weren't. I don't want to go in that thing again. He means the laboratory, interrupted Divine. He got in there and was shut in by accident for a few hours once. It put the wind up him for some reason. Lo, the poor Indian, you know. He turned to the boy. Listen, Harry, he said. That kind gentleman is going to take you home as soon as he had a rest. If you'll come in and sit down quietly in the hall, I'll give you something you like. He imitated the noise of a cork being drawn from a bottle. Ransom remembered it had been one of Divine's tricks at school, and a guffaw of infantile knowingness broke from Harry's lips. Bring him in, said Weston as he turned away and disappeared into the house. Ransom hesitated to follow, 
but Devine assured him that Weston would be very glad to see him. The lie was barefaced, but Ransom's desire for a rest and a drink were rapidly overcoming his social scruples. Preceded by Devine and Harry, he entered the house and found himself a moment later, seated in an armchair and awaiting the return of Devine, who had gone to fetch refreshments. <laughs> 